Um, so we're going to do a Q&A now with Jeff Moss, who is the founder of Black Hat and Defcon and many other things. And Dino here, and would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. He's the head of security at Square. Not the head of security. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I lead the mobile security team at Square. Okay. I uh, co-authored the a book called iOS Hacker's Handbook, Mac Hacker's Handbook. If you, uh, if, has anyone heard of the contest called Pwn to Own? Yeah, so I won the first one, stayed up all night, wrote an exploit against uh, Mac OS X, and sent it over and won. Um, and what did you do with the money? I bought a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a Mac Pro, I got the top of the line one, and I got the monitor, and I kept it for like, a ten, like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, DEFCON 7 CTF? Yeah, I, I played in DEFCON 7 CTF, that was like a, forever ago, I got second place. I spoke for the first time at DEFCON 8. Most of the stuff I do is low-level binary exploitation. Um, so, like, and what I do now is protect mobile phones so people can use them for, uh, for selling them for commerce. So that's stuff that I know, you can ask me, ask me anything. Um, as he mentioned, I held up a cardboard sign once that said no more free bugs on it. <laughs> so I have opinions about bug bounties. That's right. Let's start with that one. Like, he, that's what he asked. So it's like, what's your opinion on bug bounties? So uh, let me kind of take this back to what the time looked yeah. like back then. So bug bounties actually are a thing now. They weren't always, obviously. Everything comes from somewhere. And back then, that was 2007, 2009. And there's actually very few bug bounties. And so there was a couple companies, there were third-party bug bounties, like a company called ZDI, a company called iDefense. And I think Firefox had a $500 bug bounty. And um, what some friends and I discovered, well, we're saying, like, we had all re reported vulnerabilities, and it was nice when they ignored us, but sometimes they also, like, lashed out at us. And we're like, hey, we're volunteering to help you make your product better. Why are you being a jerk to us? And um, so No More Free Bugs was about just basically saying, hey, we've kind of had enough of, like, the Doing expectation. Doing your work for you. <laughs> we had the expectation that we're, because we can, we're supposed to volunteer all of our time to help make like Microsoft, like a massive billion dollar corporate corporation, help them make their products better when we think that they should be doing their jobs to make the products better for their users. And so we just said, hey, we've, we kind of had enough. We're going we're gonna to devote our time to programs that have bounties, and we think that more people should have bounties. And so now that's kind of a common thing. And so the nice thing about a bounty program is it switches from reporting a bug to someone who, who uh, may not care because like when they have a bounty, they obviously care. They're asking you to spend your time to help them, and you know you're not going to get sued. You know you're not going to get, you know, get a, a nasty email from them. So you can say, "Hey, I'm going to do things for people that appreciate it." So that's a good thing. Yeah. So it's like, I think bounties. <laughs> TLDR: bounties good. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got like a million years of combined experience up here. We're happy to talk about anything. Well, I can start randomly picking people. I don't, you know, yeah. it works either way. They're like, no more swag, so yes. There's an interesting like, uh, trend nowadays that people try to make phones and laptops that are fully like understood from the lowest level up, like just to make sure they are as secure as possible. What do you think about that? Is it, do you really lag really like behind the performance of current PCs uh, by years? So. But are you talking like a black phone or crypto yeah. phone or one of these types or of Or like devices? the Novena laptop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see how, I think it gets you a certain level of assurance, but if you're paranoid and you're buying that thing anyway, you're never going to trust it anyway. Because unless you're reading CPU masks, how are you going to know memory controllers, you know? And, and if there is an exploit and they do get persistence on a controller, how will you know? And the problem with all these devices is you can't just like set some jumpers and revert it to a known good state, and it like reflashes the video card, and reflashes the network stack, and reflash. it doesn't do that. And so, even if you get a little bit nervous, like, hey, I was just in China for two weeks, what should I do? <laughs> well, there's nothing you can do, because nobody makes that product that reverts it. So, um, I, I like the aspiration of it, I just don't think they're there yet, you know? And it's probably healthier from a security standpoint just to assume that it's going to be compromised and design mechanisms around that. You know, like a lot of people have like their mobile hotspot and then their cell phone and they, because they don't trust the baseband on their mobile phone, so they only use Wi-Fi to the thing. It's separated and they use Tor, so it doesn't matter if that's compromised and now they have separation and instead of trying to get it all on one device. One of the things also, I tell people like, 
to, uh, if you're doing banking, you're doing like private banking and bill pay, it's like I tell people, spend $200. It's like buy a Chromebook, buy a small sub book, and do all your banking on that device and only on that device. Don't have email set up on it. Don't have anything else set up on it. That is just where you connect to the internet to go to that bank, to go to that bank site, to go to those pay sites, and you do that. And as soon as you're done with that, you shut it down. You don't let your kids use it because they want to go to, uh, you know, Disney or anything like that. It just for yeah, banking and financials. Purpose. There is no other configuration for it. And then you put it in a drawer until it's time to make bills uh, payments again, or it's time to check your uh, your, your bank statements. It's less than two hundred dollars, and that makes it's secure. It's like it's not just a device that is secure or not. It's the way that you use it also makes it secure. I personally, I only trust computers that I've made myself. So I try and mine the materials. Like I go, pick up the offer. <laughs> so He's far, more hardcore than we are. So far, I've made an abacus. <laughs> but, slide rules next. Slide yeah. rules. I can, but I agree with Jeff. Basically, like I think actually I think projects like that are really cool. Like there's some things like I like this thing called the Fairphone. That's like basically all like use replaceable parts and all this stuff and it's like it gives you a lot of knowledge about how it works and I like as people are starting to think about um, like I like I actually like iPhones because they already thought about like we don't want the baseband to have a persistent firmware we don't want the secure enclave to have a pers persistent firmware and um, so it's all stateless and I think that's that's done for a lot of security reasons but it's not open source and like a lot of these open source um, like the pure open source hardware are thinking in the same direction, but you have full visibility. At the minimum, it teaches you a lot about how um, how uh, computers work. And when, as mobile phones, like mobile phones, are much more closed, like in computers, computers now are much more closed systems than the ones that like a lot of us learned on. And so things, things let you tinker and learn. Is the best part about it. But also with open source, like not everyone's looking. Like the the idea that many eyes make all bugs shallow. Um, for security doesn't really work out because basically it just means that not everyone's looking for the security bugs, but the people who are looking, they can usually find the bugs easier. And hopefully they're the ones that are going to tell you how to fix them. I think it was him this and guy, you. Yeah. Him and you. Yeah. Uh, in terms of in your experience with Square, what was one of the security challenges that you had for the mobile application? Uh, what are the challenges we have for the mobile application yeah, at Square? In terms of security. Um, so well, one one of the things we did actually that I think is not really not really a challenge with mobile, but I think the approach that we took is we have uh, hardware that basically does encryption before it gets to the mobile phone, so we don't actually have to care about the security of the mobile phone as much um, because it's encrypted by hardware and it goes all the way to it's only decrypted by hardware security modules in our back end data center, and um, like Jeff said, it's like you know assume compromise. So when you do something like this, it assumes that the mobile phone can be fully compromised. But you're still safe, and um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. So, Scott, um, you just released an internet connected rice cooker. <laughs> how, how would you guys exploit that rice cooker? Exploit the rice cooker. I don't. I wouldn't know where to begin because I'm not very good in the kitchen. <laughs> Burn it. Look at it. Um. Does it have an IP address? And if it does, oh, yeah. scan it. Find what things are open. If it doesn't have anything open, then you go upstream from it and listen to what it's talking to, and then pretend that you're whatever it's talking to. I mean, well, you can make it. Odd, like, right? You can make well, it. So the problem, I'd say, the problem with all these things, whether it's the rice cooker or the toaster or whatever it is, people assume one. They assume like, well, how are they going to harm me? Yeah. And it's like, well, they might not harm me. They might just harm all my neighbors, right? They just might take over my toaster and make it a node on a botnet, right? So now you're part of a bigger problem. And you might just say, hey, how come my rice cooker's always on? Yeah. It's busy, like, stealing credentials from half the world, right? It's attacking your smart fridge. Yeah, it's, <laughs> they're, yeah they're having issues. But actually, to give you a technical answer, um, I'm a reverse engineer. That's what I like doing. Um, so what I would do is I would first figure out how to get the software off of it. So I, he, he suggested listening to the network. Like, that's not as interesting to me. I like, I like disassembly. So um, what I would look at is... Um, JTAG ports? I, actually, I'm lazy. I start with serial. Yeah. Basically, like most uh, hardware boards are going to have like a UART serial that you can do, that you can just connect to. And so many devices will just give you a serial console. So basically, just open it up, look for um, you know, two leads. Um, I was playing with like a child's like Android tablet a while ago. We were, like, my friend and I were like, we're staring at it, like, 
we I know it's here somewhere. And then there's those there's like big and green. We're like we just didn't look for like big ones. And we're like, oh yeah, yeah those are the pads. Boom, plugged it in. Got a serial console. Got root instantly. And most like the vast majority of consumer embedded devices run Linux. And you just find the UART connected on connect to it, power it on. You'll start seeing like um, usually a U boot. And then just like hit a key and it interrupts it. And you're, you can do stuff. And then once you get the software off, you can start um, uh, like reverse engineering it. And I would look at look at it on the network, try and match that up to the software. See if there's some <laughs> private keys that shouldn't be on there. Right. <laughs> and see how you can like overclock the rice cooker. You're like, what if I can make it <laughs> my rice faster? Right? Well, see, I look at it from the darkest. Like, well, I always, like I said, I always look at the worst case scenario kind of stuff. So yeah. in my uh, third book that I'm writing now, I kill someone with a refrigerator. <laughs> and it's like, because they had an internet connected refrigerator and the person was able to get access to it, was able to turn the refrigerator off, and the guy was a diabetic who had insulin. You have medicine that has to stay refrigerated at a certain temperature. If you have meat or certain foods in there, you can turn the refrigerator off, have that food spoil. It's like have the insulin go bad, and then turn the refrigerator back on. And the person goes home thinking that their insulin is good, they put their medicine in, and they die. It's, yeah, uh, and you actually, death by the <laughs> But not as fun and cool and neat. It's like, I just killed someone with a refrigerator. <laughs> I know I know lots of people that kill people with refrigerators and they yeah. don't mean to do it. Yeah, it's like, well, this is, that would be a way to do it. So, so you got to look at it from the bad side. It's like, you know, so it's like there, there's always something that someone can, if you could overheat or superheat the, the, um, the contacts of the rice cooker to where it burns and it starts catching on fire, it's like, and then it starts to fire in the house, and no more house because you know well, you wanted it. Then you short the cooker. stock of the rice, <laughs> man. Exactly. and then you use that guy's financial tech platform yeah, exactly. to do the trade. And there you go. Yeah. So it's like so. Yeah. Well, this. and I you guys are evil. I just wanted to make rice faster. Oh no. <laughs> I'm just convinced that when the toasters start burning, that we'll get software liability. Yeah. And that'll probably happen in my lifetime because. Yeah. The difference now is it's no longer like the Oracle server at work is down. It's like my house is on fire, yeah. and I've got to sue somebody. Right, exactly. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. What do you think of AU2 uh, disclosure? Uh, is zero day market is dying? Full disclosure: zero day market is dying. Oh, and he's, that's la it. And he's that's laughing. It. Yeah, that's it. Wait, I was like, I tried to connect a sentence. I'm sorry. Full disclosure: what? Yes. Um, what do you think of it? A full disclosure? Yeah. The zero-day market. Um, so full disclosure is interesting. Like, I actually never really was a fan of full, full disclosure. Well, sorry. When I was 16, I thought full disclosure was awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah. um, mostly because I was taking rather than giving. Um, but uh, when I started, like, stuff that I found, like, I didn't actually really like fully disclosing it. Like, I thought, like, I felt, I felt irresponsible just dropping full, um, like a full exploit on the internet because I knew that there was like a 16 year old like version of me who would be like, oh, cool. <laughs> um, and I, but, um, so I, I was never a super big fan of full disclosure. I think like, I, I like kind of the more staged disclosure. Like if you give people, say, hey, there's a bug, you need to do something from actual information and then later on give people um, more. Right now, more. now what do you think it's doing is I think, the other part of your question was, what is it doing to the zero-day market? Right. So before, I mean, now you've got bug bounties, you have other avenues. Right. So I mean, for like, basically, the less bugs there are, the less of a zero-day market there's going to be. And so the question is, like, all right, is full disclosure getting more bugs fixed? Um, and are bug bounties getting more bugs fixed? And basically, the more um, that that happens, the less room there's going to be for a zero-day market. So then let me ask you this. Are bugs sparse or dense? Depends on in what. So that's that's what that's, that's yeah. always confused me. Like yeah. basically, people say like, you know, sparse or dense. It's like, well, that's the Dan Gear question, right? right. And so it's if like, it's if it's dense, then bounties are probably worthwhile, and trying to corner the market on them is probably right. worthwhile. But if they're dense, it's like, well, you're going to spend all your money on right. bounties and. But in what? Like okay, in technology, the vulnerabilities are incredibly um, dense because there's so many bugs and yeah. so many different things. But like that's what of them don't matter. Like bugs in this in like the rice the rice cooker right now don't matter because no one has them. And so <laughs> it's like there's a ton of vulnerabilities that just don't matter. But how, are there a lot of vulnerabilities that are like, you know, internet crushing, world ending, remote SSH, remote SMB, 
actual abilities, no, those are very sparse. Um, and so it's, you know, turns on the what. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, um, we're generally getting better at solving, you know, fixing last decade's bugs. <laughs> you know, the, bug, the, bug, the bugs that I care about, they're like, I'm like a, mem what people call a memory corruption dinosaur. You know, just like, and so like I'm watching the stuff that like, the stuff that I like, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of going away, going away. But, I, but I've heard enough times where it's like, oh, it's going away because of ASLR. And it's like, oh, no, that didn't have to be true. Um, because then there's browsers and use after free bugs, and now browsers are getting better. And it's like, oh, memory corruption bugs are going away because of, of you know, this new security mitigation. And then, oh, hey, Internet of Things, cool, I can hack with the rice cookers. So it's always 1999 somewhere, you just have to find where that is. You're always parting like Well, and you wanted to, we were talking earlier, um, maybe rehash the conversation a little bit about yeah. logic bugs. Yeah. Right, so there's only a certain amount of mitigation you can do. Right. So yeah, we were talking earlier about the Cyber Grand Challenge. Has everyone, has everyone heard about that? The DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, if you haven't heard about it, it's a contest to develop software to automatically uh, find and exploit vulnerabilities. And so they have a, like a sort of a test, you know, computer architecture, and you compile binaries for it of a bunch of different common bug classes, and people compete with their sort of artificially intelligent, um, uh, you know, they're called CRS, I can't remember what it stands for, but programs to basically find and exploit these bugs. And, um, and they're having a contest that's man versus machine, or sorry, person versus machine. Um, and, uh, and basically it's like, one, I can't do things faster than a computer, but I can do things computers can't. And so if I'm having to compete against a computer that knows how to do this thing, I'm gonna find out the types of vulnerabilities that it's really bad at. And it's probably bad at logic bugs because those are human errors. So I think about like, all right, what's the human error that someone's gonna make and do this? And I could beat the machine, probably, but it wouldn't count because they've already stacked the dice against me. <laughs> yep. What's your opinion on the idea that zero days are considered as weapons and whether they should be regulated as such? For for a country that's not very good at regulating guns, I don't know how. Uh, well, I, yeah, so in the United States, I'll just say briefly, you've got a problem with free speech. And um, so far, I don't know of any, anybody that's regulated or made illegal zero-day sales. Um, and you have to just look at, like, what's the difference between a zero-day or just you found a problem, right. right? Does the guy doing the unit test who finds an exploit, is he now a zero-day broker when he brings it to his manager? You know, who... Like, you, you get into these huge problems. We, I'm a, a member at the, the Council on Foreign Relations, and we just had a meeting um, talking only about zero days. And basically, at the end of the meeting, everybody is sitting around saying, well, we can't even come up with a definition of what a zero day is, let alone a good one, a bad one, a, you know, what a marketplace would be for uh, a zero day. And so I think if you were going to try to regulate them, you'll, just, you'll quickly run into these problems of you can't even define it. Um, and so people say it's sort of like, well, I'll know one when I see one. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it's the same I, problem is that that's never really stopped the government from trying to regulate something for them understanding it. It's like that for them to try to regulate. They'll still try to regulate it no matter if they don't understand it or not. So that's a problem. But like I said, I don't think it's going to happen. It's like, I mean, because of the fact that it's free speech, it's, 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 it's too vague. It's like, I mean, they can Well, but it, yeah, and it's sort of like saying the electrician, can the electrician not tell you how to burn down your house. Right. Or, and the, pro the other problem is a lot of, um, so Dino would probably speak really well to this. When Microsoft releases a new security patch, people like Dino can compare the old patch, I mean the new patch, the old code base, see what they fixed, tell it's a security problem, and now he knows what the zero day is. Right, so even if you regulate them so nobody can talk about them out loud, but only the companies get them, you can still reverse engineer them and right. still get your hands on them. So shutting everybody up doesn't prevent them from leaking because the other foreign governments or whoever wants to get their hands on them, the criminals, they'll still get their hands on them. You're not going to stop bad guys from getting their hands on them the second a company patches it. And as for exploits being weapons, like, so a zero, even like a zero day exploit that just launches a calculator, you can't say that that's a weapon, right? I, th I think basically there's a lot, of, a lot of this discussion has focused on the wrong piece. You know, if you want to yeah. talk about what is and what isn't a quote unquote cyber weapon, 
I think the cyber weapon is the payload. Like if it like if it blows up your rice cooker and burns your house down, that sounds like a weapon to me. That's physical damage. Or if it takes but out a nuclear centrifuge, that's probably a weapon. Right. But like, <laughs> but I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just saying. Quit um, talking crazy. Yeah, I, remember, I remember when like that came out and there's all these like articles about like this can spread and it can do all this stuff and I was like, let's see, I don't have a centrifuge at home, I think I'm fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, think, I think I'll be a cool on this one. Um, but, um, um, cyber weapons, oh, the payload is what's the... Yeah, the payload, and like that is that is what actually causes damage. And also the other thing is, we see how few machines are actually up to date. And so like, okay, so let's say you had to regulate, decide what was a weapon, either zero day vulnerability is the weapon, or a, you know, a payload that is destructive is a weapon. Well, you don't usually need zero day, because everything is unpatched. So I can say, okay, I didn't use zero day, but I still had a payload that burned your house down. But it's not a weapon, because it didn't use zero day. It's like, no, you still burned my house down by exploiting my rice cooker. Mm -hmm. And like the fact that you used an old lib PNG bug, you know, it, it's, I think that's where the discussion needs to be. And it's like, what is the real it's world the effect? Yeah. yeah, the real world effect, the real world impact. And, um, well, I think they were saying like 99% of, of, of malware and the way botnets get created is not with zero days. Like, right. Zero days are never used. Right. right. Um, you know, they have all zero like days, only criminals will have zero days, basically. <laughs> so. It's actually better if you don't use a zero day because um, if you use stuff that's old, then you know that the device isn't being maintained. Yeah, well, there's, there's also, also a fast, think about it, yeah. from a nation state perspective, you don't want to do anything new because it creates a fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. It's unique. You want to look like everybody else, and if it can yeah. look like common criminals, then let's use the it's old stuff. It's even better if you can look like another nation state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, that always works. Yeah. Attribution is hard. The problem of this discussion is because a lot of it's being driven by the U.S. legislative branch. And the fact of the matter is, um, currently, I think there's only two members of that branch that are not licensed lawyers, um, i.e., they don't have experience in anything other than the law. There is yeah. one doctor and there is one civil engineer, I think. I think that, actually, I read an article that I think there's four, four of them that have computer science, or maybe two that have computer science Seriously. backgrounds. But it's yeah. still like. Yeah, but still, I mean, you know, it's, and, and that's the problem. That, that's, much of this debate is brought by the U.S. Congress. And the U.S. Congress is represented by people who. Not well, this, this particular debate was driven by the Wassenaar arrangement, yeah. right? When that came out of the, the privacy groups in Europe, okay, right? So they forced the United States. Essentially, when it came time to implement the United States, the researchers were like, "What the hell is this stuff?" Yeah. Okay, yeah. right? And so we're putting this one on the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> and and the frustrating thing is like. You know, what was it? The hacking team was totally compliant with Wassenaar. Yeah. And because they got a waiver from the they government. They got a broad yeah. waiver from the Italian government being like, yeah, cool, do whatever you want. And, and You so would never get that waiver in the States. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically, I'm like, all right, so I can see what you're doing. You have noble intentions. But the problem is it's going to tie our hands, like the tie defenders' hands around the world. And so I, this is not the right tool to achieve mm -hmm. what you want to achieve. Yeah. And you your, can, your opinions on oh, the Apple and FBI issue that's been going on in Oh. Apple versus God, that should probably be over beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so the one, the one thing I do want to bring up on Apple versus uh, versus FBI, um, I think initially both sides are being a little disingenuous, right? There's not one side that's totally being honest. They're both kind of angling for their own advantage. But if that was a modern iPhone, and Dino can totally tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, if that was a modern iPhone, we wouldn't be talking about it because the security enclave and the hardware is different, right? It just, Apple would not really be in a position to do anything to help them. Is that pretty well, fair statement? It, the, 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 the problem is there's still, this secure enclave still runs signed code, signed firmware. So basically the, firm, the signed firmware that the FBI asked Apple to make um, to run on the 5C, if that is legally permissible, then they could also ask Apple to make a signed firmware for the secure for the, enclave, right. for the newer hardware to do the, to achieve the same effect, to turn off the, um, Ten. Turn off the, the the wipe and the delay, mm -hmm. and because then on newer phones it's, that's implemented in a secure enclave, and so it's the that legal principle being set would allow them to ask for the same thing on the new hardware. Okay. The new hardware does not have a technical technical um, thing that prevents that because oh, okay. Apple never the design Apple like the, that was never in the threat model that Apple themselves would be compelled to right. compromise the security. But it is now. But it is now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
and not, and not just them. Like right. every like, I, so I work at for a Silicon Valley company, and basically once this happened, everyone was talking about how can we make sure that no one, we never have to do this. Right. right. No, I mean, there's a huge push right now where companies are trying to get out of the middle. They right. don't want to be the man in the middle anymore. Right. Uh, Microsoft is on their Azure cloud is trying to figure out how do we not hold any keys? Right. Like how do the customers hold the keys? Because we don't want to have to have 400 lawyers right. dealing with, I mean, that's not in their business model. Right. And, and, to, and to put it as someone who doesn't have to worry ever about getting top secret clearance, it's like it was, a, it was, it was trying to set precedent. It was like they found an opportunity due to their incompetence when they first handled the case to be able to find a law to set precedent so they can get this and start doing it blanket. And yeah. Apple was like, no, that's not cool. It's like, you know, it's well, like the other interesting thing Apple would have helped. It's like if they would have come with the warrant with the actual, and Apple has helped in the past with the with law enforcement, with subpoenas, with the actual warrants. They have helped on that. It's like they have done things like that. U.S. companies have helped when the government has come and said, you know, this was sketchy from the get-go. It's like the FBI screwed up the, the first part of the investigation. Uh, Apple by, was helping in this case. Exactly, and the FBI had them reset the iCloud password, which screwed up everything. They didn't take it back to the location. If it was on the home Wi-Fi, it would have been okay. It's like, and they're like, oh wow, we totally whispered. You gotta help us now. It's like, because, it's like, and then someone else thought, it's like, ooh, if we use this case, because it's got terrorism in it, That'll scare everybody to, to do the right thing and, 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 and do what we want because, I mean, it worked with the Patriot Act, right? It's like no one's read that. Everybody signed it because it said Patriot. you got to be a Patriot. you got to sign it. It's like it now it's, Genius. It's, 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 it's now documented that more cases that are involving the Patriot Act are drug-related, right. not terrorist-related. So but imagine like, that. In, in the U.K., they use their surveillance laws to catch people's dogs who poop. Exactly. So, so I mean, that is that's where it's going to go down to, and Apple knows that's where it was going to yeah. go down to, well, and they were like, no. And also, they didn't use the secret FISA court, so right. Apple wasn't gagged. So this case, they could actually talk about publicly. Yeah. So there's a bunch of mistakes made that made it to their advantage to say it out loud. It's like, you didn't get us with the secret gag order. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Along that lines, I think like a, one of the big things about this case is I think there's a. Washington and Silicon Valley don't understand each other, which is clear by the fact that the FISA court wasn't used because I remember reading when this happened and I was like, wait, it looks like the Department of Justice is trying to get into a PR battle with Apple. And I was like, a PR war with right. Apple. Apple. <laughs> Apple is a company that special, like basically uses PR to sell devices. Right. Like, that is their product. They are the masters well, just like of when this. That, uh, so when Apple had their big legal response to, to the FBI, uh, I remember people are like, I just read the Apple response. It's very clear they have better lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> like they can buy better lawyers, yeah. and the Justice Department can buy. Yeah. Them. But so it, to me, it boils down to basically. Reader, you look. It's it, like it, <laughs> it boils down to one thing, which is, um, and I don't know what it is in your whatever your home country is, but um, in the United States, the manufacturers are trying to figure out: is it legal to produce a secure device? Because mm -hmm. if it's not legal for you to produce a secure device, you need to figure out what your business plan is, mm -hmm. right? But if it is legal to produce a secure device, right? That's a big fork in the road. There's not a lot of middle ground right. there, right? And then the problems we run into in the United States is there's been some Supreme Court rulings around code. Not on this point, but they've been tangential that say that essentially code is free speech. So therefore, compelled speech is illegal in the United States. So compelled code would be illegal. So if the government can't compel you to code because it's considered speech, right? So we're rapidly running into these like dead ends with not a lot of gray area. So if the Supreme Court continues to rule that speech is or code is speech, I, I don't know what the government's going to do, right? And if you're if you, you're allowed to create a secure device, right? So then uh, it's really interesting because it's going to get sorted out in the next ten years. It's, this this yeah. is not going to remain this. Gray area. Not yeah. They're going to have to learn not to screw up so much in an investigation. It's well, and the, the FBI would have had discretion to pull a 220 year old law. Right. That had not well, been used in any way, shape, or form. You have the Ritz The Act. law that they yeah. used is the law that basically lets a judge find a person who refuses to take an action in a legal thing. Like, hey, like, he sues me, and, I'm, 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 and I have to pay damages. And I refuse. I put my arms like this. This law is used to put me in jail until I will sign the check. That that was the purpose of the law, and they took it and totally bent it. Right. And it's actually used actively, but it's yeah. never been used in 
this fashion. Right. It was a gas yeah. from start to finish. So we're getting close to beer time. Maybe we'll take one or <coughs> one more more questions. Uh, I was just wondering when you usually meet like um, maybe non-technical people in real life, um, how do you uh, introduce yourself and like what you do? <laughs> I go out of my way to explain that I'm a hacker. It's like, I mean... I thought I, you were going to say you go out of your way not to meet normal people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but normal people drive cabs. And it's like, yeah, I run into them in, 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 in malls. But it's like, uh, but no, it's like whenever someone's asked, it's like, especially when I'm playing because they see my bag, it's sort of, it's not like I'm hiding it or anything. It's like, it's sort of obvious I'm weird. So uh, they just want to know what type of weird I am. <laughs> And I tell them I'm a hacker. I was like, look, I, I help secure things. I help uh, keep things. I, I help by trying to fix it and trying to secure it and trying to break it to show where it can be broken so it can be fixed. That's what I do. It's like, it's a, but you never shy away from being called a hacker. It's like, that's how you get rid of the stigma. It's like, it's like you own that. It's like, you're a hacker. It's like, I mean, I come from a long line of hackers I'm never going to be worthy of to be in the same group of, like Tesla and like uh, uh, Da Vinci and Turing and, and Hopper. It's like those are hackers and stuff, you know, that I will never, I'm still in their shadows. It's like, and I'm okay with that. But I do a disservice to them by trying to hide the name. It's like by trying not to claim who I am. So, yeah. So do, you, do you think it's a bit of like confusion with the word hacker? Oh, there's always yeah, been there's always, yeah, sure. You're like a full-stack developer or... Steve Wozniak. <laughs> full-stack developer. Steve Jobs Steve Wozniak uh, sold blue boxes illegally that helped uh, uh, cheat the telephone companies out of money. They were... That was criminal activities. They were hackers. It's like who did criminal acts, and now they own the phone company. So it's like, you know, irony. It's like uh, Bill Gates got caught breaking into the uh, computer time company for his school so he could get more computer time, actually stealing the admin user ID and password. His punishment was that he had to get uh, forfeit his computer time. It's like, and he helped form a billion dollar company, Microsoft. Aaron Schwartz owned a million dollar company and he downloaded uh, technical manuals and manuals that were already open sourced or free from subscription that he had and he was hounded to death because he was a hacker. So That's what's changed in 40 years that we need to try to and it's going to keep getting that way unless we start doing something about it. No, no, the difference though now is um, every TV show has a hacker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, say, don't say the CS no, no, what I mean is, it used to be like in the old TV shows, I, I, uh, there's this concept in film and, and storytelling called the MacGuffin, and the MacGuffin is the object that allows you to advance the story plot. So, it's, so normally it'd be like, they have to find the device, the MacGuffin, that allows them to break into the bank, right? right? And that's like the placeholder for, I don't know, the secret key, the path, whatever it is. So they used to have like the hacker that's the MacGuffin. Well, we need to find the blue car, where's that? I'll just hack into the database. And, a and it's on 3rd Street. Right. Great, the main characters race off to 3rd Street. Well, I can make a thing in Visual Basic. And <laughs> <laughs> so the MacGuffin characters have now evolved into like main characters, and now yeah. with Mr. Robot, they've turned into the story. And so I think it's no longer like the token icon. Hackers right. are now like full stream. They're, they're, they're getting I tend to do a little different. I tend to not tell so the next person, the next question they're going to ask. I'm right. like, no, I don't write note.js, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I won't break into your boyfriend's account. I know. That's, 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 the, that's, other that's one. the actual one. But yeah. Yeah. now actually, like, in, at least in like, the tech community in like, Silicon Valley, like, for instance, the address of, of Facebook's office is one hacker away. And so they're basically claiming you know, hacker to mean just programmer. And or and like like a software reverted engineer. back to the original like, meaning. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and like or just like there's been so many meanings, and I'm just like I'm like no 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 I'm the kind of hacker that like I, I break things I do cool <laughs> stuff They're like like write no DS I'm like no. <laughs> <laughs> specific for here? Um, so we were here for our Black Hat Singapore that just happened, right? So, and we'll be back again next year. Um, and over the years, we've had DEF CON groups in Singapore. They come and go. 
Um, and for some reason, the security community in, in the past has just not been very sticky in Singapore. It's like four or five people get together and want to do a group, and then a year later, it's like it's gone. And it, it happened year after year. And they usually have a lot of ambition. One, one group is like, yeah, we're going to compete in the DEF CON CTF next year. <laughs> How many CTFs have you competed in? You know, it's like, well, none. But, but you're probably not going to place. You know, but they have like huge goals. The ambition was there, though. That's yeah, they had the ambition. And then they would, you'd run into this reality, which was there wasn't a lot of security jobs ever in Singapore. And there's no security startups, very few. So really, they come out and they're like, I'm gonna, what am I going to do? I'm going to go work for PwC or Ernst & Young or something, right? And so there is no, there's not an incubation factory pumping out these startups. Um, and so I think that's what's led to the DEF CON groups coming and going. So this time we're going to take a much more concerted effort and really try to foster one. And, and think, that's this guy right here. Well, I think this is a great start. I mean, this, I mean, every one of you in this room can be part of a DEF CON group and still be part of this group. It's like one of the biggest things that I've run into in like uh, in several other countries in this region where there's like, well, no, I'm already part of this group. And I'm like, no, it's not like gang colors, okay? <laughs> it's not like you can be blood and the Crips and stuff. Y'all you know, you know, can't meet together. It's like, it's not like that. You can literally be part of this group and be part of the DEF CON group uh, as well. It's like, it's the, this out, this whole format is basically just like a regular DEF CON group would have as well. It's like, so it's like if you get the people that want to do more technical, like 3D printing, or learning how to do password cracking, or want to learn some more of the down and, and dirty and stuff, you know, then start saying, hey, why don't we keep meeting here on Fridays at this time? It's like, and the DEF CON group, we're going to be learning how to do this stuff with Tally on Wednesdays. It's like at night. It's like, and just have the group still be part of each other, still communicate with each other. It's like, but just be doing uh, different kinds of things, more specialized things. So, uh, I mean, this is very encouraging. It's like, I mean, even if, I mean, quite honestly, it's like, I like this, even if there's no formal DEF CON group, you know, sorry, it's like started here. I like the fact that you're here now. It's like, this is a great showing and stuff, you know, people that are interested in computer security, that are interested in hacking, that are taking time out on a Friday night to come here. It's like, usually I'm spending my Friday night playing Call of Duty or World of Warcraft. So it's like, y'all are doing way better than I am. It's like, good on you. Cool. Yeah, we just want to thank you for having us out. Um, we have one more question. Oh, yeah, great. great. Hi, uh, what kind of precautions do you take? To protect your own data. And <laughs> well, I, I don't know how paranoid you are. I'm pretty paranoid. <laughs> I mean, like, for example, like, here's my phone. It's always with me. And there's my laptop in the backpack that's always within sight. And I never leave it behind anywhere. And so you can't just. Do it. I mean, like, this guy showers and he can see his phone yes. out the shower, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. He'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> He'll take his phone into the shower, but not a towel. <laughs> We're not going to discuss how he knows that. Perfect. There's different stages. It's like, I mean, I learned. Like a seven stage acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 this went off the rails very quickly. That's usual. Um, but no, from a like security standpoint, I go to the point where it's like I actually have, uh, you know, Veracrypt folders, like the. I'll shoot a true crypt. It's like I actually will take my stock machine uh, that I'm using for mostly for work, and it's, if it's got what, a one terabyte hard drive, then I've got a 500 gig uh, folder uh, or file. Usually I call it, you know, screw you dot fourth amendment, you know, or something like that. Uh, and then I create another folder which is about uh, 200 gigs, uh, which is, and then the 500 gig, all my VMware that I actually do my work on, and I do everything through VMware's are in that 500 gig uh, folder. And then the 200 gig folder is my transfer files that are shared with between the other VMwares. So I usually run about four VMwares. I got one VMware that I do nothing but social media on. I got one VMware that I do my work and email with. It's like, and I've got another VMware that I'm surfing with, and then another VMware that I'm doing my hacking and research and stuff that I'm doing projects with. And, then and they all share the same folders. But then you can also snapshot revert. Right, exactly. So something no bad happens. I found so, that my laziness exceeds my paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's like, I'm not paranoid. I know they're out to get me, okay? <laughs> I know it. Yeah, exactly. The feeling in my tooth told me, okay? So it's like, I, I know what's happening. I only trust, you know, aluminum tinfoil that I, I made myself for my hats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Um, but actually, like, I find, like, I think, think about, the best thing to make sure you're not being paranoid is, like, know what you're protecting against. Like, for me, I think, like, all right, yeah. the thing I need to protect, protect against is someone trying to own me on Twitter or something like that. They <laughs> send a link, and I click it, and they take over my computer and put my email on the internet. So I just use a Chromebook for that. You know, yeah. and then I back to the $200 book that you yeah. do nothing but. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, guys. Okay. Questions aren't over. If you want to come up to so, us separately. Yeah. Oh,